Jesus. Those of you on the live stream, man, I want to welcome you as well. Man, I thought it might be like back in the old days. It was just me and the live stream and the band. So uh, appreciate you guys showing up live today and uh, being here, man. Jesus is still on his throne. He's still ruling. And it's a crazy time out there, though. I know kind of got the big surge going on in San Angelo. And then I get up this morning, and there's a dust cloud from Africa. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. We needed that, boy. Appreciate that. So I thought, man, I need a vacation, but I can't even take a vacation. Can't go anywhere. And I thought, well, I'll just stay home for a couple of weeks. And I'm tired of doing that. So I don't know, man. Anyway, I'm, remember back in the day when we took vacations? Take a vacation, go on a mission trip, you know, back in the old days. And then sometimes, like, the anticipation of the trip was just as good as a trip because you could be at work the week before you went on vacation, somebody giving you a hard time, you're kind of like, man. Then you're just thinking in the back of your head, like, next week I'm going on vacation. I don't care, man. I can put up with anything for a week because next week I'm going on vacation. No matter whatever happened to you, next week I'm going on the trip, man. So sometimes, you know, the anticipation of something helps you get through it. Well, I want to talk about today, man, the most anticipated thing possible, all right? And I want to do it, uh, I want to talk about heaven a little bit today, all right? And I want to do it from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, one of Kirkland's favorite passages of Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you have your Bible, you can open it up. And, uh, man, I really appreciate God. I was thinking about this, that, uh, you know, God revealed the fact, the reality of heaven to us, so we know it's coming. And then secondly, I thought, man, I really appreciate how he ordained it where this life was first and heaven was second, right? Because sometimes in this life that we live, life can be difficult. You know, like Jesus said himself, you know, in this world you will have tribulation, and we do have tribulation, man. We have difficulty sometimes in relationships. We have difficulties with these bodies, you know, you know, difficulty with disease and discouragement or depression or even death and all these different things, all the deadly deeds that we have to deal with on this earth, man, are difficult. And so I appreciate God putting this life first and heaven Second, to give us something to look forward to, and the fact that heaven's going to last for all of eternity, and uh, it makes earth a little bit, our time on earth a little bit shorter. So, Paul talks about it in uh, 2 Corinthians, and so let me take a look at it. This is 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 1. Boasting is necessary, it is not profitable, but I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. For I know a man in Christ who was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a human being is not allowed to speak. I will boast about this person, but not about myself, except of my weakness, Paul says. Now, Paul writes this particular passage of Scripture in reference to a group of men that had showed up in Corinth that he referred to in chapter 11 as super apostles. These were men that came along and began to preach a gospel, but it was a different gospel than what Paul was preaching. It was Jesus plus, okay? Jesus plus. It was like, hey, you got to have Jesus to go to heaven, but it's Jesus plus circumcision or Jesus plus works or Jesus plus something else. And there's a lot of people that are like that today. They want to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace of Jesus and add works to it. Yeah, You can get to heaven through Jesus, but it's Jesus plus living like this or Jesus plus doing like that. And these particular people would exalt themselves, which is what you have to do when you're counting on the law to get you to heaven. And they would say, well, I've got this education or I've had this vision or I've had this revelation or I've, I've spoke to these people. And they would exalt themselves. And then at the same time, they would put down Paul and say that Paul had not experienced those things. Now, normally those type of things didn't really bother Paul, but in this particular case, they were preaching a false gospel, another gospel, another Jesus, and a different gospel. So Paul, to offset that, does a little boasting of his own. And this is what you see in chapter 12, verse 1. Boasting is necessary. Now, basically, Paul's going to boast about three things in this particular passage of Scripture. As Warren Wiersbe puts it, first of all, he's going to glory in the fact that God has revealed things to him through visions and revelations. That God honored Paul by revealing through him to, uh, things to, through visions and revelations, okay? And that's kind of what he says right here about visions. I'm going to talk about visions and revelations. If you guys want to talk about visions and revelations, let's talk about some. Now, Paul had received several different visions and revelations, and the first one happened on what we know as the road 
to Damascus, that Paul was a Pharisee. He was on the way to Damascus to persecute the church. And as he was going along, it's recorded for us in Acts 9, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him, falling to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, he asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He had this revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus asked him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And at the time, it's interesting to note that Saul was persecuting the church. But the church, you see, is the body of Jesus Christ. So when you persecute the church, you're actually persecuting Jesus himself. Jesus revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus, and Paul gave his life to Jesus Christ and began to follow him. Another really classic vision that Paul received from God is what's known as the Macedonian vision. This took place in Acts chapter 16. Paul, on his missionary journey, wanted to go to one part, wanted to go to Bithynia, and the Holy Spirit did not allow him to go into that area. He didn't know what to do, and he received what he said was the Macedonian vision. It's recorded in Acts 16, 9. During the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. The next morning, Paul got up and said, man, God's given me a vision. This is where we're supposed to go. It's very significant because this is when the gospel went to Europe for the very first time. Of course, from Europe, it came to you, the Macedonian vision. But Paul wants to go on and talk about another vision. Now, you, now you might be here today and you say, hey, man, second service, maybe you're on a live stream. You're like, dude, I wish that happened to me. I wish, Paul would give, I wish God would give me a revelation or God would give me a vision. But the reality is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you're listening online or you're here in second service, man, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it's because God has revealed Jesus to you in a way that you could see him. The only way you can see Jesus is if God chooses to reveal him to you. In Matthew 16, you have the apostles there with Jesus, and Jesus asked him a question. Hey, who do people say that I am? And the apostles said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist or a great prophet. Then he asked this question, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, speaking for the whole group, responds to him. He says, man, we, we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to that, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father who's in heaven. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you should rejoice because God has chosen to reveal to you the reality of Jesus Christ so that you can respond to him and be saved. Now, if you're here today and you understand about Jesus, you're listening and you understand about Jesus, you understand that Jesus Christ came down, lived a life that you could not live, died on the cross to pay for your sin, was resurrected on the third day back to El eternal life. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you too can have eternal life. If you understand that, it's because God's given that revelation to you. But it's not enough to know that unless you respond to that. In other words, you have to take that information and re respond to it. It's not enough to know about Jesus. You have to then turn and come to God and by faith ask him, Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? I'm trusting in you, Jesus, to get me to heaven because I cannot do it on my own. And when you take the revelation from God and combine it with your faith, for by grace you are saved through faith, least any man should boast. It's that combination that enables you to go to heaven when you die. Paul receives the vision on the road to Damascus, the revelation. Then he sees the vision of the Macedonian vision, but he also received one another. And this is the one that's recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says to the super apostles, you guys want to boast? about visions and revelations. All right, let's do some boasting about visions and revelations. Verse 2, I know a man who was caught up to the third heaven. Paul's speaking in third person now, but we know it's Paul from verse 7 because he changes the first person. He says, I, I don't know if it was a vision, if I was caught up in my body or not, but I went up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Verse 3, I know that this man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, was caught up into paradise. Now, biblically speaking, Paul says, man, I went into the third heaven. There's three different heavens in the Bible. The first heaven is what we consider the clouds, our atmosphere. And in a sense, mankind has conquered the first heaven. We've flown, obviously, over the clouds, that type of thing. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is above our atmosphere. We're talking about the planets and the, and the stars and the sun and the moon. And in one sense, you know, mankind's conquered that and that man has walked on the moon, but the third heaven, we're talking about the place where God 
dwells, heaven of heavens, the third heaven. No, no man can get into heaven without God's help. And yet Paul was caught up into the third heaven. And it says in verse 4, I was caught up into paradise. Okay? So the third heaven is how far he went, and the paradise is the, the extent to when he went, that God himself went into the paradise, which is, is the very presence of God himself. Paul says, man, I was caught up into the third heaven, into the very presence of God himself. Can you even think about this? Just imagine this. Paul gets caught up into heaven. Now, two things this passage of Scripture teaches. Number one, the reality of heaven. There is a place. And number two, God can take somebody there. There is actually a place, and God can take somebody there into the very presence of God himself. Now, this so impacted Paul you understand this about Paul, you can see this. It's reflected in his writings going forward. So you can look at other passages of scriptures that maybe you might have passed over before, but you could look, for instance, at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly tent, which we live in, is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal dwelling in the heavens, not made with hands. How would Paul know that? Because he's been there. He says, man, I know, we know that if this earthly tent, this body in which I have is torn down, we have another one awaiting us in heaven. How would Paul know that? Because he's seen that. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, in, eight, uh, verse eight in fact, we are confident and we'd prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. In other words, as believers, the minute we leave our body, we go to be at home with the Lord. And Paul says, man, I'm confident that I'd rather be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. How can he be so confident? Because he's been there. Dude, I know what it's like. I saw it. I saw stuff I can't even talk about up there. So unbelievable, I can't even share it with you. I heard things spoken that I can't even speak to other people. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How does Paul know that? Dude, because he's been on the other side and came back. It just changes when he saw that. So I've been in the paradise of God. Revelations 2, 7 says, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To anyone who conquers, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, the very presence of God. What makes heaven heaven is the presence of God, man. It's when you're in the presence of God, it's peace and fulfillment and joy. Psalms 116, uh, you reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is fullness of Joy. Paul says, I was caught up into the third heaven. He says, I was caught up into paradise. That's a phrase only used four times in Scripture, two times in 2 Corinthians 12, one time by Jesus in the book of Revelation. And the fourth time it's used by Paul himself in the book of 1 Thessalonians, another book that Paul wrote, Paul teaching about the second return of Jesus Christ. And some people, he had taught on it, and then some people had died, and, and the church was concerned about the people that died. They said, did they miss out on the return of Jesus Christ. So Paul writes to them this letter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and he addresses that, and he puts it this way. This is 416. For the Lord himself, talking about the return of Jesus, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, those that have already died, will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up. There's the phrase. It's where we get the word rapture, we'll be raptured up, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so that we'll always be with the Lord. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air, so that we'll always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the classic passage on the rapture of Jesus Christ, the same exact phrase, that in the end of the day, in the end of the age, there's going to come a point when Jesus Christ is going to return. And when Jesus Christ is going to return, all those that have died in Christ are going to come back with him, and those that are alive are going to be caught up to meet him in the sky, the rapture of the church. And obviously, in this particular time and age, many people are saying, dude, what do you think, Kurt? I think we're in the end times right now, right? And I can most assuredly tell you we are definitely in the end times. Because the end times, biblically speaking, began with the ascension of Jesus Christ. It, it started the time ticking right there. We're definitely in the end times. You say, well, are we, oh, is Jesus Christ getting ready to return? Well, I'll tell you this. We're closer today than we were yesterday. Right? 
And, and it's just speculation because Jesus himself said nobody knows the time of the date when Jesus Christ is going to return. We, we don't know, right? But you can certainly see how it could be or how it could lead into it. And people say, well, that kind of freaks me out. I kind of, that kind of makes me scared. This whole thing just kind of makes me scared. And here's what I want to say to you. Hey, don't be scared. Get prepared. All right? So scripture says we should be prepared for the second return of Jesus Christ. How do you get prepared? You make sure everything's right between you and Jesus, right? If you've yet to give your life to Jesus Christ, now would be the perfect opportunity to do that. Because if you're a believer in Jesus, when Jesus Christ comes back, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's going to be the greatest day of celebration you've ever seen. It's going to be the biggest party all the church has ever seen. It's going to be a day of light, and we do not walk in the darkness. It's going to come like a thief in the night, but we don't walk in darkness. We're children of the day, right? So, man, then maybe this is, maybe this is the precursor to the end times and Jesus is going to return. When Jesus returns, brother, it's going to be a party, all right? And we're going to be ushered into the very presence of God himself. We should be celebrating that stuff. We, we shouldn't be scared. We should get prepared. And you say, well, why did... Why did God give this vision to Paul? Okay? Why did, why did he get that vision? And, and the reason is because, man, what God had called Paul to do was not going to be easy. God had a call on his life, just like he's got a call on your life. And what God called Paul to do was going to be incredibly difficult. In fact, if you just look back in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul lists some of the things that he went through in his life. Starting in about 24, he says, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. This was a Jewish punishment where a guy would take a scourge, you would flog you. And according to the tradition of the elders, the Mishnah, they, they could not hit someone 40 times because if they did it, they might die. And if you hit someone 40 times or more and they died, the one giving the flogging was responsible for that man's death. But legally, they could give you 40 minus 1. They could give you 39. Five times Paul received the, a flogging. Three times in verse 25, I was beaten with rods. This was a Roman punishment. They had a guy that was called a lictern that would take this birch rod and beat you with it. When we get the expression, take your licks, this is where it comes from. Three times I, I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. They threw rocks at him until he, they thought they killed him. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea and just on and on on frequent journeys. I faced dangers, dangers from rivers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, from the city, dangers at sea. Paul had a crazy hard life. And so Paul said, dude, to help you through it, I'm going to give you a little taste of what's going to happen next. I'm going to give you a little vision of what heaven's going to be like. So God gave it to him to help him through the difficulties of his life. And so he writes to these super apostles and says, you guys want to boast about visions and revelations? We can boast about visions and revelations and stuff. He says in verse 6, for I want to, if I want to boast, dude, we could do some, I could do some boasting. If I want to boast, I wouldn't be a fool because I'd be telling the truth, but I will spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me and hears from me. I don't want to just be always talking about some vision that I had. And if you want to know the reality of Jesus Christ, look at how I live my life. I could be boasting if I wanted to, and I'd be, I'd be telling the truth, but I'll spare you so that no one can credit me with something beyond what he sees in me and hears from me, especially because of the extraordinary revelations. They were just crazy, but I, I don't want you just thinking about the revelation. I want you to see the reality of Jesus in me. But because of these extraordinary Revelations, therefore, verse 7, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. And concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he would, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. You see, Paul we see these three experiences, the glory of God, where God revealed his glory through the visions and revelations and the goodness of God, where God humbled him with a thorn in the flesh, and then God's grace, where God helped him when he was weak. God gave him this thorn in the flesh to keep him humble because God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, and grace is the power of God to accomplish things. Now, 
people speculate as to what this thorn in the flesh that God gave Paul was, okay? And some people say, well, it's a spiritual temptation or some other type of carnal temptation, but it, it appears there was something physical. There was something physical in his body that just caused him reoccurring pain, okay? And some people think maybe it was his eyesight. So in the book of Galatians, he concludes it with like, see what great large letters I'm writing with. I wrote this with my own hand. Uh, you guys would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me that maybe something was wrong with his eyesight that he couldn't see, that maybe his eyes like would weep and it was just disgusting to look at and just a limiting factor. And some people think it was he had this malaria that gave him reoccurring migraines and they would just hit him and he had to deal with headaches and, and uh, all different kinds of speculation. But, but we understand this, right? Because we all perhaps listening or we know someone that has some type of physical ailment that just limits them from living like God intends for them to live. But in this particular case, Paul says, God gave it to me to humble me. And I pleaded with him three different times that he might take it away. But in exchange, God gave me the grace to see my thorn in the flesh in a different light. And I see it. He spoke to me and said, for my grace is sufficient to you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, he says, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that the Christ power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, when I get to the end of myself, when I can't do what God has called me to do because it's limitation, all at once God comes through and does what only he can do. God's strength becomes available to me. If you really want to experience the reality of God in your life, you have to be willing to follow him all the way to the point that you cannot do it. And then at that point, God will come through himself and do it. In your weakness, he'll be strong, and you'll come to know God in a whole new way at that point. So in, in other words, we're in a series called That's a Great Story, all right? So all of you here that are alive, I want you to just think in your mind about a biblical story that's a really great story. Just something out of the Bible that's a really great story. If you're online, just think of a story that's a, you say, that's a great story, and just, just write it in the comments. Type it in the comments. I'll tell you a great story, all right? Just type in your story. Daniel in the lion's den. Jonah and the whale, you know, uh, all sorts of, I think about, I think about Moses, man, you know, like Moses standing there, got the whole Egyptian army behind him, the whole nation of Israel's trapped by the Red Sea, and Moses stands up there like Charles and Heston, it's just like, and the Red Sea just parts, dude, and the whole nation of Israel goes across on dry ground, like a couple of million of them, and as soon as they get over there, here come the, 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 the Egyptian army, and they all get drowned. That's a great story, right? And, and, or you think about Abraham who's promised this child and he can't have his child because his wife's barren and God keeps promising and he keeps doesn't have it. And then he finally has a child of promise, Isaac, you know, when he's 100 years old, he has Isaac. Like, dude, that's a great story. Or you think about Gideon. My favorite story is Gideon. Gideon basically takes on 135,000 Midianites with 300 dudes. Like, he started off with 22,000, and God's like, no, dude, you got too many. If anybody's scared, tell them to go home. He gets down to 10,000. He said, oh, no, you still got too many. Have them go down there and drink water. Anybody that laps like a dog, right, those are the ones. So he, he gets down to 300 versus 135,000. They break some clay pots and win the fight. I mean, that's a great story. Or like David and Goliath. David's a kid with a slingshot. Goliath's nine foot tall, and David wins. I don't know what your story is you're thinking of right now, okay? What story you put in your comment section. But chances are it's a story about someone coming up against something that they cannot overcome. It's a story about someone coming up against something that they cannot overcome, and yet God does it for them. That when they are weak, then they are strong. That's what makes it a great story. Last night I was working on this sermon, and I've been working on it for a while. This, this, this passage of scripture's got a lot in it, all right? And, and you might be a person out there dealing with a physical thorn in the flesh, and this scripture has a lot to say about that type of thing. 
It's a very deep, particular passage of Scripture. And I'm trying to think, how do you preach this in 30 minutes? And my wife is there with me. She's over in this chair and across the living room reading a book. And uh, I really appreciate this because my wife reads a lot of books. And then if she comes across a really good part of it, she'll read me that part of the book. So it's great for me because I get to read a lot of books, but I don't really have to read the book. I just get the good parts of the book. And, and so this happened to me. This is last night, kind of finishing up this sermon, and she goes, hey, I want to read you a story. And so this came out of a book. It's called 12 Faithful Women. And this is a story about a woman named uh, Helen Rosevere, who's a missionary to Congo, Africa. She went over there in 1953, spent 20 years over there. And they, they found this story in one of her journals. So I'll just read it to you. It goes like this. The mother died in childbirth leaving behind a premature newborn and a two-year-old daughter. Keeping the baby warm was essential for its survival. With no incubator or electricity, the hospital relied on hot water bottles to warm newborns, but their last bottle had burst. Helen and her staff managed to keep the baby alive through the night by having one of the midwives sleep with it next to the fire. The next day, Helen gathered the orphans who lived at the mission for a time of prayer and she told him about the baby and the big sister and the need for the baby to stay warm in order to survive. She asked him to pray, but was thrown by the prayer of a 10-year-old Ruth. Please, God, send us a hot water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead, so please send it this afternoon. And while you're at it, would you please send a dolly for the little girl so she'll know that you really love her. While this prayer may not sound audacious to you, Helen knew that it was a near impossible request. There were no pharmacies selling hot water bottles anywhere close to Nebo Bongo, Helen wrote. The only way God could answer this particular prayer would be by sending me a parcel from the homeland. I had been in Africa almost four years at this time and had never, never received a parcel from home. Anyway, if anyone did send me a parcel, who could put in a hot water bottle? Who would put in a hot water bottle? I lived on the equator. Much to Helen's surprise, a large box from England, the first one she had ever received, arrived at her doorstep that very afternoon. She called to her the orphans who had prayed that morning, and they opened the package together. Carefully, she untied the string and removed the paper while the children's anticipation grew. The box contained Colorful knitted jerseys and bandages for hospital patients. There was soap and a box of raisins. Then Helen reached in and pulled out a hot water bottle. She couldn't help crying as she realized how small her faith had been. Little Ruth immediately announced, if God has sent the bottle, he must have sent the dolly too. Sure enough, the last thing in the box was a beautiful baby doll. The package had been on its way for five months before Ruth prayed her prayer. Right? Just whenever we are weak, right? Whenever we're weak, I want you to think the key ingredient of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number one thing about the gospel is that we are not good enough to get to heaven on our own. We cannot get there. We cannot be good enough. We are too weak to get to heaven. And the reason is we have a thorn in the flesh called sin that lives in all of us. And this particular sin just keeps us down. We take one step forward and two steps back, and we think we're making progress in our sanctification. This sin comes up. We, we do not have the ability to get to heaven on our own because we are too weak. You think about Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he is crucified, and why is in the garden? He knows what's going to happen to him the next day. He knows the sin that's going to come upon him. So he begins to pray to the Father and ask him, God, if there's any way this could pass over me, would it do? He prays to the Father three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's recorded for us in Matthew 26, 39. He, going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. I don't want to do it, God, but if that's what you want me to do, I will do it. He prays a second time, Matthew 26, 42, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. He prays a third time, the same type of prayer, okay, but then that night in great weakness, he is He's arrested, he's falsely accused, he's beaten, he's flogged, he's forced to carry his own cross, and he is crucified. 
the most inglorious possible way to die ever, that the Son of God is crucified, and in great suffering and weakness, he dies. But then three days later, God, in this incredible act of strength, resurrects him back to life, and not just back to life, but new life, eternal life, never to die again. Why? Because when you are weak, then you are strong, right? And Paul recognized something about this and recognized that when he was weak, that God was strong in him, and just like when Jesus died on the cross in that strength of the resurrection, it made heaven available to us when we respond by faith. Paul recognized the fact that when he was strong, that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, heaven then was opened up to anybody that heard it and responded to it. That when we recognize that we are weak, then God, Jesus, does something, and we become strong in through Jesus. This is why we come to Jesus in the gospel. We, we ask him to do something in us for when I am weak, then he is strong. This word paradise we talked about, it's only found three times in the Bible. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, which I mentioned to you earlier. And it's found in Luke chapter 23 when Jesus is being crucified. And when Jesus is being crucified, he's, there's a thief on either side of him. And on one side, this one thief mocks him. The other thief on the other side, the dude is being crucified. There is nothing he can do to obtain salvation. He cannot do any works. He cannot do anything good. He cannot be good enough. He is in absolutely the weakest position possible for a person to be in. He's being crucified. He's going to die in a few hours. And on this cross, this guy looks over at Jesus, a thief on the cross, and all he says is this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In great weakness, remember me. Jesus looks back at this guy. He says, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Why? Because when you're weak, then you are strong. And we recognize our true condition before a holy God. And in our weakness, we come and say, well, I cannot overcome this. We become strength. We become strong in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, we recognize our weakness. Father, forgive us for the times that we think we can do it, we can obtain it, when we think Jesus plus. Father, we ask that you would help us to see our true condition so that in our weakness we might look to you. And Jesus, you might make us strong in the name of Jesus, that you might be glorified, that you might open up the door of heaven for us even though we do not deserve it because of what Jesus Christ has done, Father. We turn to you today in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Oh,